We're live. What's going on, everybody? Up, oh, see, look, me clapping already. Look, already. All right. All right. So, what's going on with all my peoples out there in the uh, Facebook Live world, Instagram world? Uh, what, where am I looking? I'm looking here. I'm looking here. Looking at, at both spots, it. both yeah. places. Here, here. People, what's going on? This is a absolute impromptu live moment with uh, me, Andy Thompson, Pastor Andy, whatever you want to call me, here with my crew. And uh, we just decided to uh, drop some knowledge, do a Q&A. This is supposed to be a, a question and answer, a legit, no joke, spontaneous live Q&A. If you've got some questions, we definitely have answers. I have answers. I'm going to give you answers. I'm not going to let Morgan answer. I got some answers for you. We will be here to help you. And uh, I think one of the things that's really interesting that I've been talking about recently and uh, in the messages on Sundays, and, and you can always go to the YouTube channel, World Overcomers YouTube channel, see all of the messages that I've been speaking. And, uh, but one of the things that I've been kind of alluding to and talking about quite a bit, and it's just kind of a, it's the tenor of Eve, even our ministry, the whole idea of balance, victory for the God designed life. The hardest thing to do is to find the balance. That's the most difficult thing to do. If you're working out and you want to make it harder, lift a leg. Because when you lift a leg, then you add that balance aspect to your work. You add your core to it because you have to, because that's why if you're, if you're lifting weights and you do free weights, free weights work you harder than the machines because in the machines, the machines, the machines balance the weight out. Whereas when you're doing free weights, you have to hold the balance. The hardest thing to do is the balance. And for everyone that lives in North Carolina or anywhere in the South or even in some part of the world where you have ditches, I say there's a ditch on either side of the road. <laughs> on either side of the road, there's a ditch. So you can be so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. You can be so earthly minded, you're no heavenly good. You can be so much about your career that you're not about your relationship. You could be so much about your relationship that you're not about your career. You could be so much about your children that you forget you have a husband or a wife. You could be so much about your husband or your wife or your man or your woman that you forget you have children. That you, you have to find that balance. And I think one of the things that I've been talking about recently is the tug of the past and the future. I don't want to be so much about my past that I always tell my future everything that my past did to me. You have to be careful that you're not talking so much to your new dude about the last messed up dude that you scare the new dude away. You need to be careful that you don't spend your whole date talking to this new girl who looks amazing about what your ex did, your ex-wife did, your last girl did, your baby's mama did, that she doesn't end up thinking, oh my God, this dude is permanently damaged by women. You wanna be careful that you're not so busy talking to your past, to your future about your past, that you scare your future away. You don't wanna talk so much to your destiny about where you came from. At the same time, you don't wanna forget where you came from. Because where you came from empowers you and motivates you to go after your destiny even more, to keep it pushing, to chase after it, run after it. I don't want to be limited by my past, but I, I do want to be fueled by my past. I want to be fueled by where I came from because that is what really gives me that energy to say, okay, I'm going somewhere. Uh, even the whole... Kavanaugh thing, which I can't believe I'm bringing it up again because I'm getting letters and all kinds of stuff. But I just think it's a fine line. It's a balance. Not, uh, it's a balance. It's, okay, how much of your past dictates what you're able to do in the future? There are some people that say, yeah, if you're going to be a Supreme Court justice, then there doesn't need to be anything in your past. And I get that. I totally understand that. I get that. I totally do. I I think if you dig deep enough in anyone's past, you're gonna come up with something that's not so great. Sexual assault, great, okay, I get it. And I, I've gotten letters from people and, and, and I don't wanna make less of sexual assault. That's not something I wanna do. 
And my wife is a victim of sexual abuse. So, you know, for years, molested. So I, I'm not insensitive to the plight of the woman that has been sexually abused. Absolutely, I totally get it. 100%, 1,000%. At the same time, once again, there's ditches. There was a time in America where if a woman made an accusation, either people didn't hear it, didn't believe it, women were afraid to say something happened to them because they thought that they would be victimized, they would be blamed, and that still does happen. People are like, oh, why'd you go up there? So there, there was that ditch. There's a ditch on where no woman is believed and women were not empowered, they were not defended, and if they reported sexual abuse or even physical abuse, I, I've, I've thought in my mind, what we really need to do is we need to create a domestic violence task force that's made of just women. Because <laughs> then they will really make sure that women, I don't know if men can really regulate domestic violence against women. But my point is, is that there was a time when we were on this whole other ditch to the left where nobody was believed, no, women were scared to report, treated horribly, subjugated as a, as, as a group, not allowed to vote, not educated, and still around the world, there are still women who are enslaved, all of it, and it's horrible, and shame on men, no doubt about it. There's a ditch on that side of the road. I just think that there's a, there's a danger, and there's another ditch. I want us to find the balance. I think there's another ditch, and that other ditch is every single accusation is believed. And if you've ever been accused of something that you did not do, or if you've ever been lied on, or if you've ever had anyone that has been lied on, then it can make you sensitive to the possibility that there is another ditch all the way over here. And I, I, we have a tendency to do that. We have a tendency to go from, I, I'm, a, I'm not against the Me Too movement. I just want the Me Too movement to bring us to a place of balance. I, I'm not, I, certainly I'm against violence against women, but I think we're getting dangerously close to a place where if a woman says he hit me, then she is believed. And you could take the most docile, calm, solid, never a record or anything against the dude ever, a guy who has never shown any kind of violent tendencies or whatever, and a woman an ex-wife, a woman who's mad, can just accuse this guy, and if she says the mix to violence, then if she said he hit me, he beat me, he what? all of a sudden, boom, you're suspended from the NFL. This whole, I was reading an article about a whole case about a, a linebacker, I won't say his name, but his girl, ex-girl, whatever, accused him of domestic violence. And the, and the NFL was on the, they had suspended him, forget, he was out, it was at the beginning, he was in trouble. He fought it, he went to court. The girl ended up coming to court. They, whether they cross-examined her or they brought this, or whether just her own, I don't know, but she ended up actually admitting that she was not telling the truth. Now I know that there are women who are saying, yeah, but there are women who are telling the truth. I agree, thousand percent. I'm not saying that women shouldn't be believed. I'm just saying that there's a ditch on either side of the road. We have to find the balance. And we, we, we can't go from believing no one to believing everyone. That, that, that's, my, that's my only thing. And I don't know what Kavanaugh did. He's Supreme Court Justice now. I don't know what he did. Um, you can have your thoughts and you can suspect and I can suspect too. I'm, I'm not gonna get into the details of the case. My, my, my point just was that I want us to find the balance in the country. I want the evil that's been done against women to bring us to a place of balance. I want the, the evil that's been done to African Americans to bring us to a place of balance. Um, I, want, I want the evil that's been done against any group, the, any group that's been subjugated, whether it's women, whether it's African Americans, whether it's Jews, I want us to find a balance to get it to a place where we're, we're balanced in the country. And right now, we just have a tendency to go from one extreme to the other. We're either far to the left 
or far to the right. It's either CNN all the way to the left or Fox News all the way to the right. And I read both because I'm trying to find the truth. I'm trying to find the balance. I'm trying to find where are we in the middle. Um, so I'm, listen, if somebody saw me, heard me, I made comments about the Kavanaugh thing and if people felt I was flippant or insensitive to the plight of women in particular who have been abused and sexually assaulted, please forgive me, it's not something I'm trying to do. I don't know. And you know what, if, if he is a violent sexual offender, then he shouldn't have been the Supreme Court justice. I totally get it, I understand it. I'm just saying that you have to allow for the possibility that there was a mistake. And I, I don't know there was a mistake. I'm not saying there was a mistake. I'm just trying to help us to be balanced. Um, I don't want to really answer any questions about that. I'm not, I, don't, I don't really want any comments on that. My whole point is just that I think when it comes to all of life, uh, balance is the key. It's why my ministry is Balanced Victory for the God Designed Life. It's like, okay, let me find that balance, that your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless, that, that, that you can't love God who you don't see and hate your neighbor who you do see, um, and that you have to learn how to prioritize and reprioritize. I just finished speaking in one of the biggest churches, probably the biggest church in New England there in Boston. And, you know, I basically spoke a message on putting the kingdom first and it's not kingdom and only is kingdom first. And just walking that balance of what it really means to be kingdom. And, um, and I think that that's a really, it's an important issue Especially when it comes to relationships, okay? I, I've, I've found myself, unfortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, I feel like it's unfortunate. I, I feel like one of the things that's happening, we were talking about it a little bit, because most, most of the people in this room are dudes right now. We've got Yolanda's the one woman in the room, and, and, and you know, we, we try to be respectful. Yolanda, is, is, she's deserving of respect. But, but we were talking about it before because... Uh, the truth of the matter is that men have done so much damage. Men have done so much pain that in a sense, it's almost like, I'm not saying we deserve to be considered guilty until proven innocent, but when you look at the track record of men, <laughs> I mean, I was watching some stand-up comedian, I can't remember who he was, and he was saying that the worst thing to ever happen to women is men. We're the, we're the leading cause of all of their death, their pain, their hurt, their abuse. For a woman to get in a car with a guy who she's never met, it's crazy. It'd be like us dating a bear, was kind of what he was saying. It's not my joke, it's his joke. But, so certainly, you know, and I, and I think that one of the things that's sad to me is women who have been so hurt, okay? They've been so messed up, they've been so lied to and tricked and hurt by men that every man they see to them is a potential threat to their security and their peace of mind. And they actually are out on a date with a guy or on the phone with a guy and they can't help but speak their fears. And to me, that's sad. Uh, and I, I think it cuts both ways. I suppose there are guys that are the exact same way. I have conversations with guys most definitely. Guys that are coming out of bad relationships, guys that are coming out of divorces, guys that had a really bad thing with their ex-wife, and they certainly look at women like women are evil or whatever. And, uh, and I think we have to be careful that we can't, that to not to let every past difficulty keep us from the future of what we have. Um, so anyway, Morgan wanted me to talk for a little bit in the beginning. Now I'm supposed to answer some questions. Have any questions come in? Anybody, anybody asking questions? Okay, so, so I'm gonna ask, answer some questions. You can send any question in you want. Morgan, Yolanda are sitting here grabbing up questions. We can, you can ask me a question about relationships. You can ask me a question about anything you want. I'm 50 years old, and I'd love to give you whatever advice and counsel that I can that will help you. We haven't done this in a while, it's cool. Yeah, so we've got a question from, uh, I'm gonna attempt to do pronounce all these names properly. Leti Leti just say their first name. Don't say their last name. Okay. Just their first name. Leticia. Okay. Uh, how do I balance family who keeps hurting you and, love, and loving them, trying to be like God, but I don't want to be around them? Sure. 
I think one of the things I talked about, and I talk about it a lot on this, whenever I do any of these Q&As, I end up talking about forgiveness. And I think that there's two types of forgiveness. There's intimate forgiveness and there's distant forgiveness. I think we have a tendency to think of all forgiveness as just one kind, but they're not. Intimate forgiveness and distant forgiveness are not the same. Distant forgiveness is, I forgive you, but I don't trust you. I forgive you, but you need to stay over there. I forgive you, but you're kind of like, you're like this. It's like, you're in this bottle, and I choose when I want to take the cap off and take a sip of you, and if I, I've had enough, so it's time for me to go home. I've had enough, so it's time for me to just kind of put a little distance. You said something that's offended me, bothered me, and you're on a little bit of a timeout. It doesn't mean I don't love you. It doesn't mean that you're not important to me. I'm not going to hold you because if I'm holding you, then I keep myself from moving forward. Distant forgiveness is what you, is what you practice on people that aren't even sorry. Distant forgiveness is what you practice on people who ain't said they're sorry. Distant forgiveness is what you practice with people who aren't even thinking about you. And the last thing you want to do is to be held back by somebody who they're not even thinking about you. They don't even think they're wrong. And your unforgiveness holds you back. It is not even doing anything to them. It holds you back. But you have to forgive them for yourself. But forgiving them doesn't mean that you trust them. Forgiving them doesn't mean that now you're going to give them access and free reign to your life to just cause havoc and pain in your life at any moment at any time. Whereas intimate forgiveness is different. Intimate forgiveness has an element in it, and that element is repentance. <laughs> so that the person has actually said, I'm sorry. The person has actually repented, and now the person is determined to change. They're trying to do better. So you, you, you end up saying something to your mother like, Ma, every time you say that, you make me feel like I'm not smart. And if her response is, you just need to get over, see, that's your problem, see, think you're better than everybody, then you can just be like, okay, uh, Mom, I forgive you, but I'm just not going to be able to spend as much time with you because, whereas if your mother is saying, listen, baby, I'm sorry, I don't mean to do that, I'm just, I'm in my role, I love you, I'm going to do better. Now you've gotten an apology. Now you've got a commitment of repentance, which means change. And now you're able to say, okay, I'm going to now begin a, a relationship and almost a new relationship with a new mom who has a better understanding of me. So now I'm going to, be, I felt heard. I felt like my voice was, I felt respected. And so now I can continue a relationship with that person that will have some intimacy in it. You cannot be intimate with someone who continually violates your conditions. And so, you know, to, I don't know if I answered Letitia, Letitia, Letitia's question, but my, my answer to you, sweetheart, is, listen, you know, you cannot continually subject yourself to people who tear you down, who, who hurt your feelings, who don't acknowledge you, who don't recognize what your gifts are. And I haven't heard their side of it, but... I am a living witness. I'm someone myself who, you know, the word says only in his hometown amongst his relatives is a prophet without honor. I, some, I think sometimes we focus too much on the hometown of it and not enough on the relatives of it. And my interaction with my relatives is, is not always perfect. I've got relatives that I have run-ins with, especially in-laws. So, you know, you know, so my point is, is, there's some of there are some of them they're taking me in doses and I'm taking them in doses. And are we gonna be intimate? Are we gonna talk all the time? Are we gonna see each other every day? Are we gonna be all involved with each other's lives? Then there's gonna have to be some 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 repentance and some change. And uh and that's the difference. Cool, great. So we've got a question from Pash Pat Pash. Okay. I'm 19, I recently just got out of a relationship and we just broke up. This was the first guy I loved. How can I get over the breakup in a healthy way and move on? Well, once again, I just finished talking about forgiveness. I think the first thing you gotta do is you gotta forgive. If, if, the, whoever, the, if whoever they did hurt you, if especially, if, first of all, it depends on who broke up with who. So if you, if you broke up with them because of something they did to you, then you're gonna have to forgive them and move on. If they broke up with you because of something that 
you did, or I don't know, you just all of a sudden they didn't like you no more, and they just didn't want to be with you anymore. Now you're going to have to move. You really felt like you loved the person, and now you're not together anymore. How can you move forward? I mean, you've got to forgive that person. And so if they rejected you, you have to forgive them. You have to say, well, if they rejected you, then there ought to be a part of you that's kind of like, well, if you don't like me, then something's wrong with you to some extent. Now, it doesn't mean I don't need to fix myself and work on myself, but you ought to like yourself enough to have enough self-esteem to value yourself. Um, you have to forgive that person, then you need to move forward. The second thing that I suggest you do is that you need to minimize your contact with them as much as possible. You can't, you're not gonna get over a person being around them all the time. You're not gonna get over a person talking to them. You're not gonna get over a person if you've got a shrine on your wall to them. No, I'm just kidding, see, I, I can't make fun of stuff. Like, that's stalking. But you, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna be able to get over a person if you know, you're still thinking about them and you're sending them texts. You're not gonna get over them if they're texting you. Because when they text you, what they said to you is, I thought of you today. And that thought is flattering. So you're not going to be able to keep this contact with them. You're going you're gonna to need a break, and you're going to need a break. Make the break clean, and you need a break. You can't really go from an rom amazing romantic relationship to now we're just friends. It's not going to work. Not going to work. Not unless you both mutually agreed, we shouldn't be together, let's just be friends. Then maybe it's possible, but if one of you said, I don't know if I'm feeling you like that, whoever still feels the love is gonna be hung up on the, on the connection. So you need to make the connection distant. You need to say, okay, I need some space, I need some time, really almost never to talk to that person again. In a sense, that's part of the way that you know that somebody really, really is for you because it's hard for you to imagine life without them. But they don't get to imagine life without you if you're still in there. They, don't, they can't break up with you and still sleep with you every now and then. They can't break up with you and then still, oh, take you to the wedding. They can't break up with you and then call you when they have a problem. They can't break up with you and then you're still doing favors for them. That you need a break. You need to make a clean break because if not, what will happen is that dude or that woman will end up being there and blocking you from maybe the new person that God has for you. you got to get some space. Um, and if I were you, I would definitely talk about my feelings about that person so that you can, enough, if nothing else, you can learn from what happened in that relationship. Talk to your, talk to your friend, talk to your counselor. You know, if you hurt too deeply, go get some therapy and talk about where you are so you can assess where you are, rebuild yourself, and move forward, and you're not bringing all of this baggage from your past relationship into your next one. Cool. So this is an anonymous one that yeah. we, we thought was a really good one. So I'm 25 and trying to start a small business. My boyfriend wants to be a part of it. Uh, like to his name to be put on the business, business papers and such, but I need for him to be my husband first, and I'm scared to explain that to him without him getting offended. I think that you know one of the things that's very interesting to me about relationships today, uh, and I've said this recently to one of the guys that works for me, because once again, I think there's a ditch on either side of the road. I think on one side of the road is this ditch of oh my God, love at first sight, and I just met this girl yesterday and now I'm marrying her. <laughs> oh my God, I just met this, met this guy. He is the one for me, child. Really, how long have you been with him? About an hour, but I'm marrying him. That's a ditch on one side of the road. The ditch on the other side is, we've been together eight years. It's ridiculous. I recently was looking on Instagram and I, I saw a woman that used to go to our church and cute girl and say just awesome. And then I'm looking at her Instagram pictures and I'm trying to look, she's in a relationship. I'm looking for the ring on her finger and I, I couldn't help it. I'm just like, how long are you going to be in a relationship with this dude and not be married? I, I just, I think that this particular world, this particular generation, and I get it because they saw a bunch of failed marriages. They saw a bunch of people. I'm going to tell you quite honestly, after listening to my parents talk, I realized that when my parents got married, there was a lot they didn't know about each other. And I, 
I, I mean, I, my parents have a really good relationship. I think they would make it today. I, I think so. But I don't know. My parents were very, my parents found out a lot about each other in the first year that they didn't know. And I think that it was just a part of their generational culture to just stick together and work it out. So that's a part of why they made it. If it was today, I, I mean, I don't want to say I don't know, but I, I just think there's a ditch. I think you can go from not knowing anything about each other to staying together forever. People together four years, five years, six years, seven years, eight years. Part of the reason why you're able to stay together that long is because you're sleeping with each other. Now, I know Andy Thompson, I am a pastor. So part of the reason why you're with each other is because you're sleeping with each other. And I'm sorry, but a dude is not really all that incentivized to really make a long-term commitment to you as long as he's getting the milk for free. I know it's just a horrible analogy because you're not a cow. But men do what they are required to do. Um, and if he likes it, then he should have put a ring on it. If he liked it, then he put a, he should have put, if he likes it, then he should put a ring on it. And you ought to have a standard as to how long you're going to give of your time. This, this woman that I just was referring to, I basically sent her, t and I said, you're in, a, you're in a difficult, you're in an interesting situation because you don't want to give a dude an ultimatum because you don't want to push him to do something that he's later going to try to act like you made me do. You might need to just say, hey, listen, I don't know if we want the same things out of life. You may, and I know that now you're going to get afraid. You're afraid of if I lead this dude, what if I don't meet anyone new? And I, I totally hear you, but you got to be careful giving your best years. You don't want to give the best years of your life to some guy. And then now you're 30 and he's 31 and he leaves you and grabs somebody 22. And now you're sitting here cute, smart, educated, and wondering where are the guys and the good guys that were trying to get married are married. Now you're looking at players and dudes who are coming out of relationships. I think the bigger issue beyond your business is you want to be married. That's the deeper issue. And if you want to be married, then you have to have a standard. I'm sorry. I know it makes me kind of old school, but I think women need a standard. And I think the fact that women don't have a standard does not help men. We're not helped by it. It just makes us less. I'm sorry. When I was growing up, you had to have some game to talk to a woman. She was fine. You had to have some game. Finer she was, more game you had to have. You see a girl across the way, and you'd be like, okay, I'm going to try to, I, I got to figure out what I'm going to say to that girl. Roxanne, Roxanne, I want to be your man. Educated rapper, I don't think that you're dense, but you went about the matter with no experience. You should know. She doesn't need a guy like you. She needs a guy like me with a high IQ. That means I had to, when I first, it's like, what do you do? The girl would ask you, what do you do? She was a girl playing hard to get. That was, girls played hard to get. That's how they were. They weren't easy to get. And I think, a, I think a quality woman, a really quality woman has a standard. And I think that you ought to have a standard for yourself. Um, and if he's a good man, then he will rise to that standard. And if he can't rise to that standard, then you need to find someone that will. And you need to believe in yourself. And then you need to make sure that you are what that kind of guy is looking for. <laughs> I want a guy in shape, then you better be in shape. <laughs> I want a guy that's got some money, then you better be ready to save money. I want a guy that gets his hair cut every week, then you're going to need to get your hair done every week. Because if I get my hair cut every week, that means that I'm into my appearance, so I'm definitely going to be into yours. Um, but when it comes to your business, I definitely wouldn't put a, a temporary person in an eternal situation. If you're trying to have a business and you want it to last and be good and be long-term and powerful, I wouldn't put his name on your paperwork and he's your boyfriend. I wouldn't do it. It's not smart. 
It's scary to do it when you're married. Uh, but but in a, in a relationship, not a smart move. But I think the bigger issue is, how long are you gonna be with somebody? How long does it take to know? My test is a year. I think you should know in a year. And I don't think that you should, I, I think that there are exceptions, but I think you should know in a year. If you don't know in a year, if he don't know in a year, he may not be serious. I wouldn't be in a, if I was a woman and I'm not, I wouldn't be in a relationship with a guy for longer than 18 months. I wouldn't do it. I don't have that kind of time to waste. I'm 24, I'm 25, I'm 26, I'm 27, I'm 28. I don't have five years to mess around with some athlete. I don't have five years to mess around with some singer. I don't have five years to mess around with some dude who kind of thinks he likes me. I don't have that kind of time. I'm a woman. 75% of all African-American women don't have anybody. I don't have that kind of time. I'm trying to get into the 25 percentile and I don't have that kind of time. You need to know, you need to understand what are you about? Move it, you, let's, you use it or lose it. Am I valuable to you? Can you live without me? If he can live without you, then you should let him walk. And the problem is that you don't have a father. That's your real problem. I said to this woman that I'm alluding to, that I said to her, if I was your father, I would be very annoyed. Clearly you don't have one. Because if I was your father, I'd be like, what is that dude doing? What is he waiting for? What exactly is going on? You're gonna have to drop that dude. Because we don't have these kind of, we don't have this kind of time to waste. Your ability to get pregnant drops off significantly at like the age of 33 or something like that. Your clock is ticking, girl. You ain't got time to mess around. Ooh, I can't believe I got into this, boy. This is, people are gonna be mad at me. But Beyonce said it. Beyonce said it. So I, it ain't even, Beyonce said it. If you liked it, then you should have put a ring on. It was a hit song, right? Is that the, uh-oh, uh-oh, is that, is that song, right? It, it, Jake, no, no, that's a different song. I don't really listen to Beyonce, but my point is, is that she ain't dating Jay-Z. They're not living together. Now, if Beyonce can make Jay-Z marry her, then Kenny from Safeway should be able to marry you. or your dentist, or your executive, or your teacher, or your, the dude that works at the YMCA, whatever. If Beyonce was able to say to Jay-Z, listen, if you like it, then you better put a ring on it, then you definitely can have a standard for yourself. It ain't even past Andy's standard, it's Beyonce's standard. And I'm, I'm chiming in saying, yup, if he likes it, then he needs to put a ring on it. And dudes need to stand up, and dudes need to be counted, and this is what's wrong with black people, this is what's wrong in the African American community, I'm so, so sorry, but this is what's wrong. We're so scared of Trump, and that we wanna have five women, and live with people, and not be committed, and not raise our children. Anyway, I'm sorry, but I'm not. That's my answer. All right. Um, this one's pretty, that's pretty interesting. How do you deal with betrayal and racism in the workplace and keep from being labeled as the angry black woman in the office where I'm the only African American in the office? I want to keep God in me and still keep them in line without choking them out. <laughs> I felt like the last line was necessary. <laughs> I mean, it's a good question. You know, I think that, you know, and obviously I, I think that everybody that's that w that's watching this or hearing this or listening to this, I'm sure Morgan's gonna turn this into some kind of podcast. So I'm sure that there's people who are hearing all of this and they're, they're not all gonna be black. I think that for all of us who are African Americans, there is, there is a unique experience that we're having being in this country. Everybody, you know, people who know me know that I'm kind of like some kind of fake Jamaican kind of, you know, and I've kind of been halfway adopted kind of 
you know, not kind of, definitely adopted by some Jamaican parents and go to Jamaica on a regular basis and love the island. And uh, one of the things that I love about Jamaica is it's just, it's very interesting to be around people of color that have pride in their nation. Black people aren't saying, and I'm proud to be an American, where at least I know I'm free. Black people don't sing that song. We don't, God bless the USA. Part of the whole thing with Trump and the football players and all of it is that they don't want to deal with the fact that black people don't really have a whole lot of pride in America. We're standing for the flag, but there's a part of us that are kind of like, oh, I don't know. How do I really feel about the country that enslaved me? How do I really feel about a country that clearly has a bias when it comes to the judicial system? How, how do I feel? So I, sweetheart, I totally get it. I totally understand. And I think it's very interesting how all of these things are kind of apropos because I think we all have our walls up and we have to be careful that we don't have our walls up for people that don't need to be walled out. It's very similar to a conversation I had with a young woman you know, who's, you know, goes to the church and we were having conversation about just about guys. And I said to her, I was like, sweetheart, I totally get it. As a result of what dudes have done to you, you have walls up. I totally get it. And those walls are good to keep knucklehead dudes out. But they're bad. It's a bad wall to have if the right dude's there. Now, right dude shows up. You're going to have to open up. You're going to have to lower the drawbridge across that moat. And you're going to have to let that open the door. And don't open it all the way. You have to glue creak and you have to peek your head out. And you have to be like, Is it, are you a good dude? Are you in here to maraud? <laughs> or are you in here to actually bless the city? In the same way, you could, you could say that as an African-American. That African-Americans have had so many interactions with white people. Sorry, white people. So many interactions with white people that they have walls up when they see all white people. There's almost an assumption that you're looking at me like uh, that you're racist. There's an assumption that you see me different. There's a res an assumption that, that you don't, and I, I get it, you have your walls up. They're just bad walls to have around people, white people that aren't negative, because not all white people are like that. There are some really great white people out there that are very lovable. And you have to be careful that you don't already have your wall up because of what you've been through. Again, what I'm talking about, son, it's, it's do I let all of my past experiences affect who I'm going to be in the future? And I also think that African-American women in particular need to be extremely careful about your image. I think black men need to, in no uncertain terms. I make my sons get their hair cut. I make them pull their pants up. I make them... I don't want them getting shot by the police. It's horrible. I know it's terrible. Black, white, black lives matter. I get it. But I'm saying to my sons, listen, I need you to be careful. Because whether it's how we're depicted in the media or whatever, I just don't want somebody to mistake you for a thug. Now, I know it's horrible. And I'm, I'm not saying the media is not a part of it. I'm not saying the country's not racist. I get you. I think black men have to be very conscious of how we look and how we appear. And... I think the same is true for African-American women. I think African-American women are starting to be betrayed as anger, angry and bitter and attitude and rude. I went to see The Incredibles. Go to see The Incredibles, right? And this last one, and it was in the first one, but in the last one, Frozone, you see my super suit? Where you think you're going? It's just like, why does the black woman have to be depicted as the person with the attitude, with the anger and the negative and that, is what's, re what's reflecting what? Is fiction a reflection of real life? Are you all starting to get to be viewed as all attitude-y? Because that's not, a good, that's not a good way to be depicted. And is that just a depiction that's not real? Or have you legitimately earned that reputation? And if I was a black woman, I would be very upset about black housewives of Atlanta or real wives of Hollywood or real wives or whatever or the real NBA wives or the NFL wives. That would really, really, if I was an African-American woman, I would be like, can you guys please stop it? 
because you're making everybody think that we're like this. When the Real Preachers of L.A. show came on, I was just like, Jesus, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus, 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 keep me near the cross. Because I'm a preacher, I'm a pastor, I have a large church, I have a pastor of a mega church. I don't need people thinking that I'm, I, I'm, I'm conscious of how I'm depicted. That whole green leaf show, I ain't even ever seen it. I refuse to watch it. I don't want to see it. I'm scared at how we're depicted. So I think, sweetheart, you want to be careful. If you are the only black person in the office, if you're the only black woman in the office, you don't want all those white people to think that you are the angry, mad black woman and every black woman they meet is an angry, mad black woman. And you need to get some joy in your life separate from your work. There's only but so much joy you're gonna get from your job. There's only but so much joy and respect you're gonna get from your workplace. There's only but so much joy you're gonna get from your career. And one of the things that makes women deeper than men is that women are able to get joy from more than just their careers. Don't be like us. You can be equal to us and not be the same as us. With a man, it's almost like if the career ain't going well, it doesn't matter. We're just not happy. Don't be like that. That's a weakness. You can't just get your joy from your job. You can't just get your joy from your career. You're not built that way. That's one of our weaknesses. Don't be like us. You also want to be able to say, okay, but I also want to get some joy from my friends. I want to get some joy from my church. I want to get my, some joy from my service. You know, I want to, I'm going to go do a missions trip and I'm going to give and I'm going to get some joy so that I'm not looking for all of my joy and all of my respect to come from the people at my workplace. You're unbalanced. You get some balance in your life, then it won't bother you so much that they're disrespectful because that's not the only place you get respect. Drop some knowledge in here today, boy. Woo! This is good. So I'm gonna switch it up uh, to more of like a light, not necessarily a light subject. Yeah, because it's getting heavy. Yeah, it's, 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 it got heavy, man. Just, Justin uh, yeah, moved yeah, around yeah, yeah. three times. Give me a piece of tissue. Uh, does age matter in a relationship? More specifically, Woo! 11 year difference. I thought this was supposed to be a lighter question, Morgan. Well, you know, I, maybe, yeah. Okay. You're welcome. Sorry. <laughs> Forgive me as I clean my nose. Okay, this, honestly, in my humble opinion, I'm saying this, not the Lord, okay? I honestly believe that a 40-year-old man has more in common with a 30-year-old woman than a 30-year-old woman has in common with a 20-year-old man. I honestly believe that. I honestly think a 40-year-old man and a 30-year-old woman can get along better than a 30-year-old woman and a 20-year-old man. Women mature faster than men do. Men have a very serious delaying in their maturity. Even when we're grown, we're still trying to be kids. Even grown men still like toys. There are guys in this room that have drones for no other reason than just to have them. I won't say who they are. It's just, it's, it's just kind of how men are. They're trucks, they're, there's a certain amount of joy that men, women are doing the work. It's not that women don't have things that they enjoy to do, doing either, but if you're watching this and you have a man, you, you have a sense, it's not that your man don't work, but if you don't let him play a little bit, he is go it is not gonna be a good place. And you are almost wondering like, oh yeah, well I have to work, but you, ha you get to play. Also, when I get home from work, I have to do this, I gotta make sure the kids, I gotta make sure the laundry, I you're over there playing Fortnite, and I'm here making sure the dishes get done. It's because there is a there is a, a childishness that men have to put off of themselves. But I'm saying all that to say that my 20, I have a daughter who's 23. My 23 year old daughter would have more in common 
with a guy who was 28 than she would with a guy that's 18. That that 18 year old dude would have to be Methuselah mature. Like he'd have to be like mature. Um. So I think of that kind of more, and I think quite honestly, tradition. I don't even say traditionally, but historically, in in the history of mankind, it is way more common for an older man to be with a younger woman. It's accepted in multiple cultures around the country. In Jamaica, where I'm fake from, my <laughs> Jamaica, it's like a guy eight, nine, 10, 11 years older than a woman. Um, I, I do know some, some relationships where the woman is older. It doesn't mean it doesn't work. Um, it doesn't mean it can't work. Um, but the ones that really work, to me, those are more the exceptions than the rule. And so, you know, that's kind of my perspective about an 11 year age difference. So. So, let's see what we got here. Um, <laughs> That's a sticky question. Okay, so here's what this is. I'm, you kind of touched on this earlier, so I think it would be interesting to hear your full answer. Why are, well, we've gotten both. Why are men afraid of commitment and why are women afraid of commitment? So I guess it goes both ways. Why are individuals afraid of commitment? I think men and women are afraid of commitment for different reasons. Okay? Women to deal with ladies first. Ooh, ladies first. Ladies first. Women go ladies first. I think women are afraid of commitment because I think that they have been, as a result of past hurts and past issues, and I think one of the saddest things that can happen is for a woman to actually be more, I, I don't know if I want to say submitted, but definitely more open to a guy that is a knucklehead than they were to a guy who's good. I've actually seen that. So I've actually seen a woman who was with a dude who was a knucklehead. It's almost like they mistake the kindness for weakness. So it's almost like they were with a guy that was a jerk and they were actually respectful to that guy. Now they're with a nice guy and they kind of treat that guy like crap a little bit. And, but they're not, they're not really committed. They're not as committed because it's kind of like, I committed before and now you know what? I'm about my career, I'm about my money, I'm about my paper, I'm about my thing, I'm about my stuff. And so they're just kind of, they're not all in simply as a result of past pains and past hurts. Um, I think that's a big part of it. I also think that there are women, I, I'm sorry, I'm not, I, I just have a tendency to believe that this is a depiction in, in our world, in our culture. I think it's something that the enemy wants to be the truth, that women are just kind of like, yep, I just want to be out here and just play the field. Um, and I suppose that maybe the pressure to be like men, because I think that there's this idea that to be equal, you have to be the same. And so I think there is, there's been a pressure on women to not put as much value on a relationship. Um, so I, I, I can say that's a possibility. I don't want to just say, oh, it's all just about past hurt. Uh, but, I, but I think that that's a big part of the commitment. I think that with men, it's a different thing. I think that men are afraid that women are going to change. I think men are afraid that... Um, they're being fooled, they're being tricked. I think both men and women, this is a way in which I think it's the same. I think there's a lot of men and women that haven't really seen good relationships. They haven't seen good marriages. So the idea of marriage, the idea of that commitment, it scares them. And they haven't seen enough good marriages to be like, yeah, I believe in good marriages and I believe that it actually can work. Um, I think there's, I think that that's a factor in it. And I think that, um, but I think that there's also men who are just kind of like, you know, why would I commit 
they're almost afraid that they're going to miss out on somebody new that may come in. Um, I know that guys are even at a point right now where they're barely even really, they won't even hardly hold your hand because they, they don't want anybody to think that there's almost kind of like a, why would I commit to the new person when there's always going to be somebody new that's going to come rolling through. Um, but I, I want to give guys more credit than that. I think there's definitely a legit fear um, as to can I really do this? Can I really commit long term? Is this really something I can do? Um, and, um, you know, can I do it? I think there are guys that are like, can I do it? Um, I also think that, like I said, I think there are guys who are just they are, they're already getting everything for free, so it's kind of like, why would I commit to something when I'm already getting all the benefits of it? Why would I commit to marriage when I already get the benefits of it? So, um, I think you can make an argument that there was a time in, not just in America, but in the world, it's definitely in America, where the only way for you to really get sex consistently was to get yourself a wife. It's, it's just what you had to do. You had to get a wife. Whereas now, um, we're just so much more loose. And it's just easier. Um, All right, we can make this the, the last question. Um, awesome. Where do you recommend someone who used to be who used to pastor to go for healing and restoration after closing their church and ministry due to a bitter divorce. Where do you go? And then they ask more personally, like, where do you go for healing? Sure. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm a proponent of counsel and therapy. I think, you know, you've gone through a divorce, you lost your church as a result of it. I think that, um, uh, you know, I, I actually have a fellowship that's kind of a new thing. It's called Overcomers Christian Fellowship. There's stuff on, on the websites that's, that's about it. I think kind of a big mantra with us at OCF is healthy leaders, healthy people, healthy people, healthy church. The church is healthy to grow. Um, and I think that unfortunately there are pastors that get to an unhealthy place. Their marriages get unhealthy, their money gets unhealthy, their bodies get unhealthy, their, their minds get unhealthy. And uh, pastors need to be pastored. If you're a pastor and you're coming out of a ministry, you're coming out of a divorce, some bad thing has happened to you, you need a pastor. You need somebody that can speak into your life. Um, someone that you can answer to, someone that you know cares about you, someone that doesn't really need anything from you. Um, and I think it's why guys like myself and others, I won't name them, um, who have reached a certain place of just blessing and success and God has helped us and now we're at a point where we're saying, okay, we'd like to help other people. We don't really need anything from you, not trying to get anything from you, um, but just the opportunity to help you and bless you. Um, and I think that that's the beginning. If you're part of an organization already, then they should be helping you. And if, and if they're not, then you need, to you need to find one that does, that cares about you, pours into you, begins to restore you, builds you up. Because you're a person, you're a soul, you, you're a child of God. You need the blood and the forgiveness. And it's sad to me that the blood that extends to the pew doesn't expend, ex, extend to the pulpit, and it should. But you can't get it from the people. You've got to get it from somebody that's above you. And I have a pastor. That's a storm warning. We're, we're, we're in like, we're in serious, no joke, flood stuff going on here in North Carolina. Pray for us here in North Carolina because Hurricane Matthew, it ain't really going to hit us though, but it's down. It's been downgraded to a level one. But anyway, um, I have a pastor. And um, I have a pastor. Somebody that cares about me. Uh, his name is Bishop T.D. Jakes. Bro. Oh, um, He's my pastor. I'm submitted to him. I'm, sometimes I, I just go to church. I, right now, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing this video because 
Morgan is a wicked and harsh taskmaster. And I really don't feel very well today. I, I want to preach on Sunday. That's my plan. But if I get any sicker than this, I'm probably just going to get on a plane and go to Dallas and just go to church. I got people that can preach. Um, because I need a pastor. I need somebody that can pour into my life. I need somebody that cares about me. I need somebody that makes my baby leap. I need somebody that makes me be like, yes, I want to feel like going on. I found that person, and I'm, I'm coming into that person. And so you need that. Um, and I, I got introduced to, to him through my best friend, Chris Hill. You all know that. He's a son, and he introduced me to him. And um, it, was, it was very difficult for me because of how large I was or whatever I am. Or it was difficult to trust again. I had been hurt by past leadership. Um, for a while, I didn't really trust, and then I had to learn to trust because the problem was me. All of those things may be true of you. I don't know. Um, but it's very, very difficult to pastor if you don't have a pastor. You need somebody over you. And I did it for a long time without anyone, and I'm, I'm not in that situation anymore. Um, and so if something was to happen to me, which, which thanks be to God, the Lord is, I'm healthier than I've ever been. But if something was to happen to me, then my care would be entrusted in the hands of that person. The same thing needs to happen with you. You've gone through a divorce. You've gone through a rough place. You've gone through a tough place. You know, you, if you're having any kind of depressive, any kind of anxiety, any kind of suicidal thoughts, you need a pastor. It's mine. I don't even know how to turn mine off. I did it. We got a storm going on. Um... You have any kind of a, any kind of suicidal thoughts, any kind of depressive anxiety, anything like that. You need a pastor, um, and you need someone that cares for you. It's, it's my. It's just. It's my phone. So anyway, this has been great. This has been really awesome. Today's Thursday. We did this at 11.30. We did it for an hour. Maybe this might be something new we may want to start doing. Um, we were talking about doing this radio show. And, you know, we talked about doing it. We wanted to have basically like an hour in which we did it. We were talking about doing it. What was it supposed to be, Yolanda? 12 to 1? So Thursdays, here's the thing, Thursdays from 11.30 to 12.30, nothing wrong with it. We could build it up, hype it up. And uh, I had a good time. And uh, if you didn't get a chance to answer a question or you're just so blown away, you want to see us, do us, consist, do us do this consistently, we could do I, There was a time when I was doing it for a while. And uh, back, in, back when Periscope was alive. But now Periscope is, has gone to see Jesus. It's, it's, it stood before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of what it did in this body, whether it was good or bad, and it's, it's dead. And, um, and we know, we have to, I don't know if we had the funeral. Did you, did you guys go to the Periscope funeral? I didn't go. Um, Facebook Live is surviving. And, uh, you know, I think I saw a blockbuster video that no I didn't, it's gone, it's dead. It's dead. It's dead. So. Alright, this was great. Until next time. Peace out. <laughs>